Hey everyone, and welcome to our sixth and final case study in comparative politics. This country, China, is like Russia, a country that I'm pretty sure you know, um, but like Russia, you know enough to get by, but not enough to really know why the country works the way that it does. Um, out of all of the countries, China is easily the most authoritarian, um, there is no political pluralism, uh, and there is a significant restriction on civil liberties. Yet at the same time, China is the second largest economy in the world um, and has um, an average GDP economic growth of about 4%, which means that it is one of the richest, one of the most uh, developing, and easily one of the most important countries in the world. So for all of its uh, democratic shortcomings, uh, China is a country that, at least in recent memory, has only experienced one episode of social unrest one episode in June of 1989. Those were the uh, Tiananmen Square student protests. Uh, student protests that were quashed by the state. And since then, we have not seen any real direct challenge uh, to Chinese authoritarianism. So, um, you know, it begs the question before we even begin, why? Right? Why is it that China, a country so large, um, so important economically, um, would be a country that, by and large, restricts any kind of democratic pluralism. Like, wouldn't it make sense for China to, at this point, um, develop even more and, you know, sort of evolve into some kind of rudimentary uh, competitive political system? And, you know, this is a question that has sort of dodged, um, you know, academics for years. And there's no real answer to this, but, you know, one plausible hypothesis is that, you know, many countries in the international community might want China to go democratic, but they're perfectly happy that China remains as it is, uh, so long as it is a key um, economic trading partner and believes in the tenets of market capitalism. So, you know, with this sense, China is really the most paradoxical country that we've looked at all semester. Um, it is not only one of the few remaining true authoritarian states, it is also one of the few remaining communist states. Now, I want to just get this out of the way real quickly. It is communist in name only. It might have started out communist in the same way that KFC started out in Kentucky. Um, but at this point, it is communist really in letterhead only. I mean, that's about it. Um, the Communist Party of China, which hereafter we will just simply refer to as the CPC, uh, continues to hold a political power monopoly and claims the right to lead or control all government and social institutions. So, you know, if we were to just stop um, you know, observing China right now, we would conclude that, um, you know, communism, authoritarianism is still alive and well in the country. But it doesn't take long to realize that the allegiance to, you know, Marxism, Leninism um, is, as I said, little more than just a rhetorical allegiance, all right? In reality, uh, the country has uh, significantly involved in its 60-plus uh, year history uh, to the point where today, um, they fully embrace market capitalism. And one does not ascend the ranks of the CPC without um, fully embracing the tenets of market capitalism. So, you know, gone are the days when China is, um, you know, characterized by collective farms. Uh, gone are the days when, um, you know, the workers have, a, you know, a stake in the country. Uh, China is officially communist, but a better way of describing it is bureaucratically authoritarian, right? So if you go back to our coverage of bureaucratic authoritarianism from a few weeks ago, uh, you find that China fits this model really, really well. Um, its leaders certainly um, continue to use uh, communist letterhead, but their adherence to Marxism is probably um, even less <laughs> than many, um, you know, millennials and Zoomers in the United States uh, today. So, you know, don't expect to go far in China if you openly proclaim your allegiance to the philosophies of Marxism. In fact, you'll probably end up um, 
at best in some out of the out of the way middle of nowhere low level managerial position or you know if you happen to be that much of an ideologue you know probably in jail um so you know with that said as i had mentioned you know china is one of the largest economies in the world um last i checked it is the second largest economy and it is the largest growing economy in fact by some metrics china is slated to surpass the United States as the largest economy in the world in about a decade. And um, if this coronavirus has any um, impact on the status quo, uh, those 10 years might be reduced to even five or six. Um, China is a strategic partner of the United States in economic global finance. Um, and I wouldn't even go so far as to just to say partner. Partner almost implies that there's a degree of equality. I think that China's relationship with the United States is, on a good day, um, interdependent. Um, China relies on the United States for being its biggest um, customer. And the United States relies on China for being its greatest importer, right? So most of our, you know, goods, you know, I, I, you know, an exercise right now, try to walk around your apartment, your dorm room, your house, whatever, and, you know, see if you can, how many things can you find with a, with a label made in China in under 10 minutes, right? So, you know, the United States and China, I think, rely on each other to such a degree that it might help explain why the U.S. isn't really all that vocal when it's trying to push for, you know, greater political rights and civil liberties in China, right? As long as the economy is doing good, as long as the money is flowing, and as long as everything is stable and orderly, um, you know, the, a country like the United States, which constantly loves to bemoan the plight of, you know, standards of living in places like Venezuela and Syria, you know, continuously turn a blind eye to China, right? So just make no mistake about this, right? China may be a growing economy, and it might be seen as an important partner uh, economically, in, you know, throughout the world, but human rights violations exist throughout the country. Um, the standard of living um, is good for maybe about a quarter of the population, uh, whereas the remaining 75 or so um, are either overlooked um, or directly exploited. And, uh, you know, to add further, um, you know, insult to this injury, uh, China is easily one of the most uh, polluting countries on the planet. And, you know, prior to this coronavirus, um, there were days in Beijing, um, you know, of, and a couple of other, you know, cities across the country where it was literally poisonous, for you to breathe the air, you know? So you know how you see these pictures of Chinese uh, citizens walking around with the masks on? Um, well, that was done beforehand just simply because the air was just so toxic, was just so full of um, contaminants um, that it became almost a health hazard. Um, and it, it just as a quick side note here, you know, China was, uh, you know, of course, the first country to be uh, affected by uh, COVID-19. Uh, it's where the disease came from. And uh, within about a month or two, uh, China's air uh, quality increased exponentially because everybody was forced to stay home, right? When the whole country shuts down, um, you'd be surprised how quickly uh, the air sort of, you know, cleans up. Um, now that China seems to be coming out from this uh, virus, and you might have seen um, articles about uh, people, you know, th um, thronging towards, you know, tourist sites, national parks, you know, there's like 8 million of them, you know, walking the, uh, the Great Wall. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how quickly those carbon emissions, you know, flare back up again. Um, but what this shows, you know, what this shows is that if China is that much of a pollutant, in the world. And, and one other thing we need to add, you know, China is unfortunately driven uh, by an economy that um, also relies on, um, you know, exotic goods and items, uh, techni you, know, is, you know, from wild animals. So China is also a country that unfortunately seems determined to drive every species except for pandas uh, into extinction. Um, so, you know, prior to the coronavirus, in addition to being major pollutants, uh, the country was widely behind um, the illegal hunting of, uh, you know, game, especially endangered species game uh, in Africa and uh, Southeast Asia. But all of this um, sort of gives um, credibility to the idea that China is certainly driven 
uh, if it is driven by anything, uh, by market capitalism. And kind of serves as a model of market capitalism for many emerging countries without having to adopt liberal democracy. Right, so one final thing to note about this country before we uh, delve into the specifics is that if there ever was a country in the last 25, 30 years to prove that you don't need to be a democracy or even a liberal democracy to be a market capitalist power, um, it is China. And uh, in many cases, what China does is prove what many skeptics have been, f have been feeling for decades, and that is capitalism and democracy are not interrelated, right? You can easily be a capitalist country and be a single party authoritarian state. And this is a rather attractive model to many developing countries around the world that, you know, a few decades earlier had to look to the United States for development. And in return, the US would kind of pressure them to, you know, liberalize somewhat. With China, it's never really an issue, right? China is actually one of the easiest countries to deal with foreign policy wise because China doesn't really have an ideology beyond market capitalism. So you want money fast. You want investments, you want infrastructure, you want some kind of initial um, capital infusion into your country um, as the spark for long-term development. Well, at this point, Beijing is higher up on your speed dial than Washington. And, you know, China has certainly proven itself to be um, a reliable uh, economic partner for places like Africa, uh, Central Asia, the Middle East, Russia, the Balkans, South America, Latin America, um, and at the end of the day, <laughs> even the United States, right? When, when all else fails, you know, China will do something to kickstart your economy. On the opposite end of the spectrum, if the Chinese economy somehow experiences some small little hiccup, well, the Dow will plunge by 500, 600, 700 points, uh, you know, within a span of a few hours. So obviously, China is quite an interesting case, right? And has certainly more of a global impact than Russia, Venezuela, India, Germany, or, you know, especially the UK. So, you know, some general questions that I would um, ask for a discussion in class were we meeting, but uh, something that you might want to, um, you know, provide in your uh, discussion forums. Why has the CPC, the Communist Party of China, proven to be so durable as opposed to nearly all other communist regimes. And so if you think about this, there are still a number of other you know, officially communist governments around the world, okay? In addition to China, you have Vietnam, Laos, Cuba, and North Korea, okay? Um, again, officially communist. In reality, none of them are communist. It's just simply a way of maintaining uh, political monopolization by a party that has kind of, you know, changed its business model, but still keeps to the old logo. But why is it that out of these five, you know, and, you know, when we talk about these, these other four, um, you know, they're really not all that economically important. Why has the CPC proven to be so durable? Why has China proven to be so important? What has what makes China stand out, um, and what makes this party, um, you know, withstand um, so many possible pressures to change and um, and um, evolve, as opposed to others? And to that, how has China resisted the waves of democracy? You now, you would think that for a country that you know, if twenty five percent of the population are you know the equivalent of middle class. Consumers, right? China has a consumer culture at this point. Why hasn't there been uh, greater pressures to democratize? Especially after 1997, when China reabsorbs Hong Kong, right? And Hong Kong is this, you know, weird autonomous model where there's greater degrees of democracy in Hong Kong, but only within Hong Kong. So it's like a single party dictatorship has this small little walled in gated community of democracy and has managed to keep that democratic model from kind of seeping into the rest of, you know, mainland. So, you know, do we see the CPC as really being successful in uh, modeling itself along the proper channels of Marxism, 
or do we see a political and historical continuity uh, with Chinese politics that predated it? Now, in other words, um, you know, is the CPC, is communism itself, um, you know, somewhat of a great wall? And what I mean by that is, does the CPC um, succeed because it keeps out all external pressures and threats and, uh, you know, other, um, you know, triggers that might weaken the country, right? You know, you, you kind of, you look at China today and you think to yourself, the country has a lot of problems and it is replete with corruption. But does the CPC kind of serve as this barrier, this type of sovereign democratic model, um, very similar in which to Russia, that keeps out pressures from seeping into political thought. And, you know, as long as the economy is doing good, the outside world doesn't really care, you know, really all that much. Which leads us to wonder, you know, how have economics played a role in making China a serious global contender, right? Again, you know, is just global economics, is, is globalization, is, um, you know, free market trade really the one thing that keeps this country afloat? Because if it is, then cool. The answer to the next hour or so of our, you know, discussions is it's the economy, stupid. It's capitalism, dumbass. Um, but you know, the one thing is that if that is true, then the country relies exclusively on continued economic prosperity. And, you, you know, economies rise and fall. Countries go through booms and busts. And, you know, here's another thing for you to jot down as we move forward. China has never experienced the equivalent of an economic recession in the last 25 or so years. Right? Every single year, China has netted some kind of economic growth. Sometimes that net is astronomical. Sometimes, like more recently, it's a lot smaller. But the economy grows every year. Now, if that doesn't say that the country isn't communist, I don't know what does. But at the same time, if the country relies on sustained economic growth, it's on borrowed time. Because eventually what's going to happen is that China is going to experience negative economic growth. And I'm not talking about growth of 2 or 1%, but I'm talking about recession, like negative growth. You know, the kind of stuff that you see here in the United States, or Greece, or Spain, or Italy, or countries like that. Okay? So if the CPC can claim to be um, a political movement that has endured, perhaps communist development in China differed from the development in other countries because it already adapted. It already adapted in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s to the point where by the time globalization happens in the late 90s, early 2000s, the country has already economically restructured itself to be very um, recipient to um, economic investment from the outside, and a growth of a consumer culture. So again, the country might be technically and officially communist, but realistically speaking, the country is probably surviving on the idea that it is not only very receptive to market economics, but it is one of the primary drivers of market economic capitalism. Okay, so that's kind of the big overarching introduction. Um, now, like we do in all of the other um, sec uh, sections, we kind of take a step back and, you know, and look at the historical developments of these countries. Because if you think that China has been somehow advantageous to all other countries throughout much of you know, recent and distant history, you're actually wrong. Right? The thing about China is that its economic growth and miraculous importance is, I would say, little more than 30 years. Um, throughout much of its history, China has been either walled off to the rest of the world, sometimes literally walled off, or so comparatively poor that even within uh, my own lifetime, 
um, certainly my parents' lifetime, and some of your lifetimes as well, for those of you who are old enough, you probably remember that China was an economic and political basket case, right? In the 1980s, the big economic giant in East Asia was Japan, not China. No one thought China was going to be as powerful as it was. So China has a very long history. It has a very gradually developing history. It is one of the oldest states in the world. One can actually, um, you know, draw um, a line, an unbroken line of successive governments prior to the communist takeover, um, all the way back to 221 BC. All right, so, you know, for at least, you know, 2,000 years, there has been something called China, right, in some incantation. And much of that 2,000 years, China spent in relative isolation, right? Fostered in the belief that, you know, living separate from the rest of the world um, made them unique, right? And, you know, this is not just by building a wall and, uh, you know, that prevents Mongolians from invading, um, but it also is characterized by, you know, effectively... Um, calling off any kind of naval exploration, closing one's ports. I mean, you know, the, the country was, I mean, I don't want to say hermetically sealed, but you know what, I'm going to just say it, hermetically sealed. Um, and that kind of leads the people, or at least the upper, you know, aristocracy to believe that China is somehow separate from the surrounding barbarians. Um, and you know what, that's all fine and good as long as no one comes, you know, beating down your door or scaling your wall or sailing into your port. And, uh, you know, by the 18th century, that's exactly what happens, right? So, you know, at some time in the 18th century, um, China is, um, you know, greeted by some, you know, Portuguese boat, some Dutch boat, some, you know, Spanish, whatever it happens to be. Um, and, you know, who, whatever European power sails into China, Right. They realize, oh, my God, this place is just replete with riches. I mean, you know, people have known about China for centuries because of the Silk Road. Um, but when they finally sail there directly, they realize, oh, my God, this place is undeveloped and comparatively speaking, technologically backward. I'm not going to say that the society wasn't advanced, but we are talking about a Western European group of countries that for centuries had been competing with each with one another uh, through the age of exploration, uh, already uh, enriched through the Columbian Exchange. And by the time they actually finally reach China, right, they finally sail into China, they realize that there's a big landmass <laughs> separating Spain and Portugal from China. It's called, you know, the New World. Then we finally get around to sailing all the way where we're supposed to go, you know, about 300, 400 years after Columbus. And we're like, okay, great. We finally reach where we wanted to. But the place is basically a paper tiger. And China quickly falls under the influence, the sway, um, the exploitation of these European uh, powers. And it is within, I would say, about 150 to 200 years that the dynasties of old uh, finally uh, collapse, right? So... You know, a little more than a hundred years ago, if you think about this, a little bit more than a hundred years ago, China was still a dynasty, right? It was still ruled by emperors. Um, you know, about 108 years ago, uh, the emperors are overthrown and a new type of political system is installed within China. Right? And this is the period of what we call nationalist China, right? From roughly 1912 to 1949. Um, China is given its first president, prime minister, secular, non-imperial leader um, under Dr. Sun Yat-sen, who uh, governs the country along, you know, models of parliamentary democracies, um, more or less competitive oligarchies that we find in uh, Europe. Uh, from 1912, the you know the establishment of a modern uh, Chinese state to his death in uh, 1925. Now, when China opens itself up to you know political models, it is not just opening itself up to European parliamentary systems. Right, shortly afterwards, like right, within a decade of this, um, the Chinese Communist Party is founded. 
1921. And one of its founding members is someone that I'm sure that you all know, Mao Zedong. Um, you know, supported as they were from a now very Bolshevik uh, Soviet Union, uh, the Chinese Communist Party was seen like most countries around that time in Asia, Europe, Latin America, the United States, right? A, a Communist Party was seen as the biggest threat, uh, not just to democracy, but also to market capitalism. Now, Sun was able to effectively, you know, run the country kind of similar to, let's say, an Otto von Bismarck, right? N certainly not as successful, but something along that lines. His successor in 1927, a man by the name of Chiang Kai-shek, um, is probably the first person in nationalist China to seek greater authoritarian rights, greater authoritarian privileges, to you know, work on unifying the country together, stamping out competition, rooting out threats, especially from the um, you know, communist circles. Um, but this increasingly uh, created a situation in which power was unified under his own personal rule. And, you know, it took, it didn't take long for a few savvy, you know, Chinese um, politicians, uh, you know, writers, academics to be like, the guy is basically becoming, um, you know, a modern, secular, uh, post-imperial emperor in that sense. Um, so, you know, Chang continues this type of paternalistic uh, rulership that is similar to the patterns of Bismarck or Putin. But he does not have the support network that either of these two had. He does have, you know, some groups, but he is unable to rein in the communists who see him as an increasingly a belligerent threat. The more that he tries to accumulate power, the communists see this as a greater threat to the state. And the more that they are given money, supplies, um, you know, followers and, ide and ideology uh, under Mao. So let's talk a little bit about this because, you know, again, you kind of know how the story ends, right? You do know that the communists end up taking power in 1949. So what is it about the Chinese Communist Party uh, that makes them so um, endurable, you know, especially um, under its leadership of Mao Zedong. Now, the Communist Party was partially allied with Sun, right? Remember, Chang's successor. Um, I think largely just because of, you know, the need for, you know, some kind of political community, some kind of political contestation. But Chang has no illusion, right? Chang looks at these guys as the biggest threat to his power structure. And, you know, it, I'm pretty certain that, you know, the guy was, you know, given uh, advice and diplomatic assurances and money and all that kind of stuff, you know, from Great Britain, from France, even from the United States, from, who, you know, whoever, uh, to openly resist uh, Mao. Because we didn't want the country going communist. And why? Because during this time period, China is still functioning as a clearinghouse of goods, Okay, so China at this point is kind of like an international Costco in which every major European and American, you know, company has a foothold in. So when we talk about this period in China, we can certainly note the development of some rudimentary political system. But be, no, but be under no illusions here, folks, right? China was seen as little more than a clearinghouse for goods. Um, all of its raw materials its uh, finished products, its textiles, and yes, its opium was um, just, just openly, openly, uh, you know, exploited by outside powers. So if anything, the communists organized along the lines of saving the country from outside exploitation and, you know, sort of continuing this earlier policy, this earlier dynastic Chinese policy of sealing the country off, you know, China for the Chinese. Or as Chang became more and more reliant on external support to keep him in power. So not surprisingly, Mao and Chang do not get along at all, right? These are, you know, just, you know, two absolute rivals in this sense. Now, Chang's got the upper hand, right? He's got the state. He's got the power of the 
uh, military. He also has, you know, diplomatic international support. So at least at this period, right, the communists of China, they're large, their numbers are growing, but they are largely unorganized, and a good chunk of their movement is made up of poor, you know, literate to, you know, illiterate to semi-literate farmers in that sense. So Mao is, Mao and the communists are banished from, you know, all major urban centers of China on pain of you know, immediate arrest and execution. So this type of um, internal exile that the Communist Party experiences, what's known as the Long March, um, is one of the big, big, big issues, one of the big pages, the big chapters in the Chinese Communist Party's history. Because the Long March consolidates Mao's power in that sense that the communists are literally forced to abandon right, key cities like Shanghai and Beijing um, and other places and cre sort of create this grassroots, um, I would almost say populist movement as they are retreating further and further into China's inhospitable Western territories, right? They pick up sympathizers. They pick up support. They kind of, um, you know, mobilize and enrage, uh, you know, the general peasantry who are now feeling the weight of taxation, of authoritarianism, right? And they're not, you know, considered, you know, to be anything more than just, you know, cogs in a wheel as far as Chang is concerned. So what happens really with the Long March is that the communist movement in China takes on a significantly national ideology, right? We, you know, if you, if you think about communism in the theoretical sense, it is very international, right? Communism, at least Marxist communism, um, embraces this idea that the state will eventually wither away. National differences will wither away in the name of, you know, universal working class solidarity, whether you're a factory worker or a farmer or whatever it happens to be. China is one of the first countries that somehow internalizes communism and makes it a national thing, especially when politics within China are very much centered around nationalism, both with Chang as well as Mao. So what ends up happening is that the Long March almost creates structures and, you know, fashions and ideology of the communists as an internal nationalist, um, you know, farmers, peasants, um, underdogs movement uh, to eventually, you know, counter and hopefully overthrow uh, this nationalist movement, okay? Uh, you know, uh, the, the nationalist movement called the Kuomintang, uh, the KMT uh, for short. Um, and when the Japanese invade China in the 1930s, an already organized communist movement becomes very quickly a resistance movement. Okay? So this idea of, you know, be prepared to, you know, defend the state and resist, you know, the oppressors at moment's notice. I mean, it just becomes blatantly obvious when the Japanese invade. In fact, what's interesting is that for the period between 1937 and 1949, the communists and the KMT, right, Chiang Kai-shek's Kuomintang, the nationalists, they kind of put aside their differences and they agreed to work together in resisting the Japanese. But the KMT kind of passively resists the Japanese because at the end of the day, the Japanese and the KMT are united in their anti-communist stance. The communists, on the other hand, don't give a damn and they're basically like, oh, cool, kill the fascist wherever you find it. So the communists were much more likely to, um, you know, take uh, guerrilla fighting to the Japanese occupational forces. Now, of course, this created greater reprisals against the Chinese people, but this just angers the Chinese and brings them more and more to the communist circle. So the point here also to be made here, folks, is that by 1945, the communists are in a much better position in China because their followers, their loyalists, their loyal supporters increase considerably. And it's not because local Chinese, you know, farmers and peasants and others, you know, read Marx or Lenin along the way. They don't really know anything about that. But what they do know is that Mao is a national resistance fighter, 
and he is aiming to basically bring the country back to a period where Chinese run the country, not internationals, right? We don't want people in Beijing that are reliant on the very forces that are, you know, bleeding our country economically dry, right? So a civil war follows the Japanese defeat in 1945 between the nationalists and the Chinese and, and the communists. The nationalists lose out finally. Um, and this is also because the Soviet Union at this point is, you know, invigorated, immobile, you know, mobilized, ready to go. So Stalin is just, you know, given money and weapons hand over fists to the um, to the Chinese. Um, Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang are forced to flee the country and they take refuge on the island of Taiwan. And it is there today that their descendants, um, both biological as well as political, have run the country as somewhat of a de facto state. It's the reason why Taiwan um, is not under mainland Chinese control. And it is the one thing that Chinese foreign policy is absolutely obsessed with getting, right? If, if China could retake Taiwan without any political or economic reprisals, not only would they be able to do it, but they could do it probably within a day. Um, and it is the one open issue that still exists within China because the Taiwanese governments are descendants of these nationalists that lost out in 1949. But let's focus on the mainland because Mao is now in charge uh, from 49 until his death in 1976. And by all... Um, by all models and by all theories, China under Mao is an ideologically driven totalitarian state, right? A good old-fashioned Stalinistic, Orwellian, big brother, Maoist totalitarian state um, with initial, wide-scale initial public support because Mao is seen not just as an ideological leader, but as a wartime resistance leader. So he's kind of a national hero to many, many Chinese. So there's not this feeling of oppression or tyranny uh, that besets the country, but the country is, you know, exhausted from war, devastated by international exploitation, and now needs to somehow rebuild. Okay? So early objectives of Mao were, you know, your typical, you know, communist um, planning uh, strategies of the time, right? Land distribution for the poor, um, full equality for women, and the eradication of opium, okay? So what was considered to be a major drug, a major narcotic, that uh, China was almost forced to grow and sell to international markets is now closed, um, and, you know, in case you're wondering where do we get our, you know, poppy, uh, where do we get our opium today? And that is largely from Afghanistan. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, a different story. Under Mao, right, China is a series of Soviet-styled command economies, right? State-run economic planning, nationalized, nationalized industry, collectivized agriculture. We don't need to get into these specifics, right? But this is just good old-fashioned Cold War, top-down, authoritarian-driven, no market capitalist, just complete economic planning uh, systems here. Um, and I'm not going to lie, um, a good number of these models um, ended up being absolutely disastrous as far as China is concerned. You know, for all of the uh, monopolization that the country today has under the CPC, and, you know, for all the ubiquitous portraits of Mao Zedong and how it is basically forbidden for you to openly criticize Mao even today, um, again, it's all rhetorical because historically speaking, Mao was, in the grand scheme of things, a horrible ruler, an absolutely horrible ruler as far as China was concerned. Uh, you know, if there's two things that people will remember about this period, it's the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. Now, the Great Leap Forward, which lasted only two years, okay, was a state-planned attempt at accelerating economic development through the establishment of people's communes right, at the expense of state-run leadership. So, 
what ends up happening in Great Leap is that the state realizes that by 1958, um, the planning models that, you know, were part of, you know, I would say at least two five-year plans uh, were not being met. Like the, the quotas were just simply not being met. So the initial idea was to say, okay, we're going to take the state's responsibility away and we're going to put the power in the hands of the public to kind of meet the quotas and do what you want. And but so before you start thinking, oh, wait, 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 is this like private property? Is this like, you know, commercial farming? No, 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 don't, don't think too much here. What this means is that um, land is going to continually be collectivized. So it's going to be appropriated by the state. But erstwhile farmers are going to be forced to till this land that isn't theirs. And rather than the state kind of giving them any sort of objectives or instructions, the idea is, in so many words, to tell the farmers, look, you know how to plant things, you know how to grow things, uh, meet this quota uh, within a certain period of time. And the problem is that forcing people into these giant communes, these, these, these large collectivized farming networks with no real industry um, results in just, uh, just a, a, a catastrophic collapse of the agricultural sector. And you're looking at these numbers, and I'm not exaggerating, uh, 20 to 30 million people die. Um, and this is die of starvation, of famine, of poor agricultural planning, because even if you grow something, the state is going to come and take it all and redistribute it across the country. So in the best of circumstances, you grow enough where you can keep some stuff after the state appropriates about 90% of it. Worst case scenario is that you grow something and everything is taken. So your labors amount to nothing. So within, and folks, this is two years. Two, this is not 20 years. This is two years. 20 to 30 million people die. So, you know, on the, you know, on the contest scale of which 20th century tyrant ends up killing more people than others, you know, Hitler is kind of an amateur in this sense. Mao Zedong killed more people um, under, you know, various policies than Hitler or Stalin ever did. So, you know, by 1960, uh, you know, the upper echelons of the CPC are kind of scratching their heads and they're saying, you know, well, how did that happen? Um, maybe we need to kind of go back to the planning board. And a couple of people realize, ah, I know what the problem is. The problem is that the public is just not socialist enough. They're not communist. They, they don't believe. They need to be properly indoctrinated. You know, the country has kind of swayed away from pure socialism. So we need to kind of like educate them. We need to instill the zeal of Marxism, which, you know, is going to be instilled by people who don't really understand <laughs> what Marxism is. And by the way, let me just take a, a little side note here. If you're thinking to yourself right now, God, Marxism sounds pretty crappy. Um, you know, at the risk of, you know, sounding like I'm Ehrenberg's uh, successor, which ideologically speaking, I might as well be, Marxism by itself would have looked at China as the only place in the world even less qualified for communism than Russia. You know? Like, if you, want to f if you want to find out where Marxism would work to the people's benefit, it's in already industrialized capitalist societies. So, you know, if we were to go back in time and ask Marx, you know, you've written all of this stuff, and this kind of sounds neat, but where do you think it would be the most appropriate? He would say immediately... Uh, Great Britain, the United States, Germany, France, in that order, right? There's no question about that. And if you were to ask him, well, what about Russia or China? And, you know, I don't know how much he would laugh. He would probably keel over from pain and laughing so much. He was like, eh, the, the, these two are the least likely places for communism to manifest. But history is kind of, uh, kind of a Monty Python skit. So we're going to implement communism in the countries around the world that are the least structurally conditioned for it. So with China, the reason why Great Leap Forward didn't work is because the idea was, well, people just aren't socialist enough. So we're going to engage in a systemic party purge. Uh, 
right? We're going to be rooting out people who are along for the ride only and not those that really believe in the cause. Now, interestingly also enough, the Cultural Revolution produces another million deaths um, over a period of 10 years. So you might think to yourself, all right, that's not as bad as Great Leap Forward. But the Cultural Revolution is actually more feared in official Chinese historical memory than Great Leap Forward. Great Leap Forward is just 20 to 30 million people dying of famine. Right? That's kind of more of a deus ex machina. Cultural Revolution is or was um, an institutionalized reign of terror because the initial idea of the Cultural Revolution was to instill a sense of proper education, right? Rather than just simply, I don't know, figuring it out as we go along, we need to create a new educated intellectual class who will learn all of the tenets of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, all that kind of good stuff, and then kind of go out into the countryside and direct. Well, what ends up happening is that it's by the 1960s. So you kind of do the math here. And who are the students? People who have no working knowledge of the Second World War. People who have already grown up within this Maoist system. So the zeal and the fervor of these younger generations actually ends up becoming a Frankenstein monster because they turn on the older party officials. They turn on um, older party bureaucrats. And in some cases, they even turn on their own parents because, you know, when you kind of radicalize them with this belief that you must root out all weakness and, uh, you know, a fl um, fl um, flagging ideology, you end up turning everyone in. So the Cultural Revolution is kind of like the closest that China ever came to a civil war, an ideological civil war. Um, and these purists end up not just um, targeting their own people and throwing them in jail, right? This is where, you know, mass arrests come in. This is where China starts to, you know, engage in, you know, gulags and labor camps. But all things in the country that are deemed not communist are also targeted. So within this period, China loses vast amounts of priceless artifacts, right? Buddhist, Confucius artifacts. This is when the Dalai Lama, yes, that Dalai Lama, he's been around for that long. That Dalai Lama goes into exile. Um, Tibet is basically put under, um, you know, police surveillance. Um, you know, nascent existing churches are closed and destroyed. Um, and just as a separate note, um, there, there was um, an ancient branch of Christianity known as Nestorianism. Uh, Nestorianism is sort of a really, really, really distant cousin of the Orthodox uh, churches and for centuries um, existed in Persia, Central Asia, Western China. Um, the Cultural Revolution snuffs out the last, to my knowledge, uh, the last working uh, Nestorian Christian uh, communities. So the Cultural Revolution um, ends up um, driving China to the brink of absolute collapse. And, you know, it only ends, let me just go back here, you know, for about a decade, from 66 to 76. And guess what happens in 1976? Mao Zedong dies. So, you know, at Mao's death, um, we could say that China was nowhere near anything that we would expect it to be today, right? China's um, whole um, existence back then was poor, not even third world. I would say even fourth world, if you really want to exaggerate here, right? Um, unbelievably undeveloped, rural, technologically uh, backward, and every attempt at trying to remedy these things resulted in the deaths of tens of millions of people um, and the complete control of all aspects of society by that state. Um, the only silver lining that I could find, 
And I say silver lining because, you know, we're going to take this into the second part of this uh, lecture in a separate video, is that if the Cultural Revolution does one thing, one thing only, it sets the socio-political playing field of the country squarely within the communist framework, um, but without any real rooted ideology. Right? So one final thing to mention before we break for the second half is that as the Cultural Revolution was still kind of raging, although by the mid, early to mid-70s it was kind of dying down, but it was still, you know, still a threat within the countryside, um, about th two to three years before Mao's death in 76, he is visited by a very important American official, um, President Nixon, who makes his um, so-called secret trip to China. Of course, it's not so secret anymore that we know about this, right? I think it was 72, 73, something like that. Um, and Nixon visits China to wide reception. He sits down with Mao, and apparently they have the conversation of the century. And while we don't really know what was specifically mentioned, we do know that Nixon's visit to China was a watershed moment that opened the country up to possible American cooperation and investment. What the United States does by visiting China and reestablishing relations with mainland China, is that it finally recognizes that Mao's China is the legitimate China. Right Up to that point, the United States had recognized Taiwan, or what they call the Republic of China, as the only legitimate country. And Taiwan, up to the mid-1970s, had not only UN representation, but it had a spot on the Security Council. What Nixon effectively does by going to mainland China is kind of recognizing the reality on the ground and realizing that China, big mainland China, could be seen as a possible ally against the Soviet Union, right? So, you know, American foreign policy at the time was, we'll work with any country so long as it's not communist. But even there, the communism qualifies only if you are either the Soviet Union or a direct satellite of the Soviet Union. If you're a communist state that is kind of sort of trying to go it alone, you'd be surprised how receptive Washington might be to you. This is not just China, but this is also Yugoslavia. Remember Yugoslavia, not aligned movement Yugoslavia? There it is. So my guess is that Nixon basically says to Mao, we will work with you in the future if you're willing to kind of change your internal configurations. Now, what may ends up happening is that in the remaining years of Mao's life, the Chinese Communist Party, um, number one, becomes the uncontested power within the country. But because the Cultural Revolution scares everybody to no end, as it comes to an end, it's clear to a number of people that ideology, communist ideology, socialist ideology, market, whatever you want to call it, are problematic. So if the CPC is to remain in power, it's going to have to do so without any real rooted ideology that drives people to this crazy, zealous end. So in this case, the state is in an interesting position because it's got support from the United States. It's got possible support. The state calls the shots, but they set the rules for what those shots can be. And it is when Mao dies in 1976 that the country makes a dramatic, a cataclysmically dramatic and important turn. And that is where I want to stop for this part of the lecture. I think that's enough for you to digest and absorb right now. What I want to do in part two is pick up with Deng Xiaoping, whom I will argue is easily the most important political figure in modern Chinese history. Far more important than Mao, far more important than any of his successors. And if you know why, 
you know why. And if you haven't gotten that far in the reading, you'll find out in the second half of this lecture. So stay tuned. We'll be right back with part two.